Great to see all of you here today. You ready to hear from the Word of God today? Come on, I hope so. Uh, well, my name is Mark. I serve here as uh, the lead pastor, and uh, it's a joy to be able to bring a message about the Holy Spirit. But before we get into that, in 1926, a professor by the name of Theodore Kaluza came up with a very strange theory. And his theory was this. He asked the question, what if the world exists in more than the four dimensions that we experience? So you guys know what I'm talking about. You've got the three dimensions of space, kind of back and forth and front to back and up to down. Those are the three dimensions of space. And then one dimension of time that we live on. And he asked the question, what if we live in more than those four dimensions? He was working in the realm of electromagnetism and he couldn't get the mathematics to work out unless there were actually more dimensions than the four we experience. Well, he was kind of laughed out of uh, the scientific world at that time. People didn't believe what he had to say. But as time has gone on, it's actually becoming more and more pl plausible that Kaluza might have been right. It happens through the smallest forms of matter that we experience. So it's back to school week. We're going to go back and think a little bit about school. I want to take you back to your high school chemistry class and ask you this question. In high school chemistry, what did they teach you were the smallest, tiniest building blocks of everything, okay? The smallest, tiniest building blocks of everything. Turn to the person next to you and tell them what you learned when you were in high school. All right, all right, here we go, here we go. So some of you, when you were in high school, learned that the very tiniest building blocks of everything were atoms. Anybody say atoms? Yeah, some of you guys say atoms. Yeah, that's what we learned was the tiniest thing. You got the whole periodic table of the elements and all of the atoms that exist there. But then as time went by, they found out there was something smaller than atoms, which were protons, neutrons, and electrons. How many people said that? Protons, neutrons, electrons. Yeah, that was the smallest, tiniest thing. But as time went by, if you went to a college maybe in the, or high school in the 80s or 90s, you would have found out that there's something even smaller than these called quarks. Yeah, quarks. And there's six different kinds of quarks. There's up quarks, down quarks, top quarks, bottom quarks, strange quarks, and charm quarks. And those are the very building blocks of the protons, neutrons, and electrons. How many of you guys say quarks? Yeah, that's what I was taught in high school. There's a few of you who were taught quarks in high school. I was not. I was left at the, uh, you know, electron level. Uh, but quarks were beyond that. But now, if you were to learn what the tiniest building blocks of everything are, they would leave you all the way down to what they call strings. And some of you have even heard about string theory. It's this idea that's supposed to be the grand unifying theory, a simple formula that explains and simplifies everything. And it's these strings that vibrate at different frequencies that make up the quarks, that make up the protons, neutrons, and electrons, that make up the atoms. But there was a problem as they were putting these uh, atoms through these particle accelerators discovering the strings and that is when they went into the theoretical physics they found out that the math did not work like we tried to make it work but it didn't work so physicists began asking the Kaluza question again well can we make the math work if it's in five dimensions what if the universe is in six dimensions ah, it didn't work in five didn't work in six finally when they got up to ten dimensions they said the math on string theory works. And the prevailing view in the physics community these days is that string theory really is true. And not only is string the theory really true, but that we exist in not four dimensions, but 10 dimensions. How's that for baking your noodle on a Sunday morning? <laughs> now, I don't know about you, but that makes me ask all kinds of questions about reality. One of the questions it makes me ask is if we live in 10 dimensions, where are the other six, <laughs> right? And the prevailing view among physicists is that those other six dimensions are rolled up in a teeny tiny little ball. Each one is their own rolled up dimension and they're very real. They might even be very vast, but because they're rolled up so tiny, we do not see them or smell them or taste them or experience them. 
It makes me ask not only questions about the physical reality, but it begins to make me ask questions about spiritual reality as well. Now, I know there are some people in this world that the more they experience of science, the more they see things like quarks and string theory, the more they go, oh, we're explaining this stuff more and more, which leads a smaller need for God out there. For me, I have the opposite kind of a response. I go, if there is a God who could create this on such a microscopic level, it makes me ask, what's the next thing that's going to be discovered after strings, to be quite honest? But it also makes me ask the question, how big is a God that creates in ten dimensions, that has all of those things that are behind his powerful mind that could put all of these things together? Amen. How big is that God? And it makes me ask certain questions about theology as well, and e even wonder whether some of the things that are problems or conundrums in a biblical or Christian worldview might be able to be resolved as well. Not just string theory, but other things, if we live in ten dimensions. If time is in two dimensions, if time is in three dimensions, and we only experience one of those dimensions, certain questions can be answered, like, how can God hear and answer all of our prayers at the same time? Or how can God be in the past, present, and future all at the same time? Or if there are other dimensions, does it explain how predestination and free will can be simultaneously true? Or if there are other spiritual beings that exist in the same 10-dimensional world, but maybe different dimensions that we live on, maybe that, that explains how we can experience their reality and yet not see them in our three dimensions. I don't know about you, but just asking these questions blows my mind. Maybe it explains why we have these strange intuitive senses that relate to reality, that we can see playing out in reality, and yet we can't explain how we got those senses. Or maybe it's possible that the new heavens and the new earth that we're created for will actually exist in there in five or six or seven dimensions. And that's why Jesus used highly symbolic literature to explain what's coming, because we can't even grasp what it's like to be in extra dimensions at this point. Now, if you like this stuff, right, if you like this stuff, and I know there's only like three people in the room who are like me on this and like this stuff. So for those three people, I've only read one book that talks about transdimensionality and the theology intersection with God in a book called Beyond the Cosmos. Uh, our friends at Parables, who I love, have made these available for us at a discount out in the uh, uh, atrium today. You may want to pick up a book if you want to research that a little bit more. But the truth of the matter is, I just spent a long time on an introduction during church talking about transdimensionality. Why? Well, for me, it expands my view of the greatness and bigness of God. And what I want to do, for me, some of my most worshipful experiences are when I have those aha moments in my mind that go, oh, God was way bigger than I thought. I can't even comprehend how big God is. And because I want to introduce a concept for all of you that we live in a reality that is far bigger than what we experience day to day. Especially if we're distracted by entertainment and our phones and the busyness of life, there is this existence that's far greater than we would ever know. That God and your existence are far greater and way more complex than you ever could have imagined. And the good news about this is that God gives us a way to intersect between our physical reality and the reality that God has designed us to experience in the spiritual world. And that point of intersection is the Holy Spirit of God. Empo existing in the life of the Holy Spirit is one of our eight key DNA statements. And these DNA statements are things that are true of Christ Community Church and we hope will become increasingly more and more true. And if you're new, we want to introduce you to this truth. And the DNA statement of the day is that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit. Somebody say empowered by the Holy Spirit. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. We remember that by the Holy Spirit, we have a source of supernatural power, that you can experience divine guidance for your life through the Holy Spirit, that the fuel in your tanks is the Holy Spirit, 
That you can have power in your life not only to do the right thing, but to have supernatural impact by the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts, interestingly, has traditionally been known as the Acts of the Apostles, but I'm convinced that it would be better named the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because as you read through the book of Acts, one of the things that you experience is the presence and power of the Holy Spirit on every single page. In fact, as you do your irresistible reading plan of two chapters per week reading through the book of Acts, one of the things I'd love for you to do is highlight every time you see the Holy Spirit at work. You will find that your pages are highlighted a lot because the Holy Spirit is there on every single page doing his work. He's present and in power. So go ahead and turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. If you've got your phones, just dial it in. If you've got the Bibles that are underneath your seats, you can pull them out and go to 759, page 759. And we're going to be taking a look at Acts chapter 2. This is the day that the Holy Spirit came for the very first time and landed on human beings. And it starts off in verse 1 saying this. That is not verse 1. I think we're missing verse 1, so I'll just read it to you. It says this. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Now just stop right there for a moment. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. First, a couple of observations. We ask the question, who are they all? They were all together in one place. Who are they all? Well, they all are the people who are waiting for the Holy Spirit. In chapter 1, we read about the 12 disciples and the women who followed Jesus. And Jesus was with them. He said, wait for the Holy Spirit to come. It had been 40 days that Jesus had been appearing, and then another 10 days until the day of Pentecost, 50 days total. So you have these prayer meetings that are happening in the upper room with the disciples and the women for 10 days waiting for the Holy Spirit. Second question that comes up from this verse is, what is that thing Pentecost all about? Because Pentecost was actually a holiday for the Jewish people before it was ever a uh, holiday of the remembrance of the Holy Spirit coming in power. So it was first for uh, the, the people of Israel. And where did that come from? Well, there were seven feasts that were prescribed by Moses 1,400 years earlier that would help them to remember God. And some of you who are Bible students might realize that there is a perfect correlation between the Feast of Passover and the day that Jesus was crucified. And there's a perfect correlation between the Feast of the first fruits and the day that Jesus rose from the dead as the first fruits of the resurrection. And there is now a perfect correlation between the Feast of Pentecost, which was the Feast of the Wheat Harvest, also known as the Feast of Weeks, that happened 50 days, that's where Pensa comes from, 50 days from the time of uh, the Feast of the first fruits. And because of that, they had a holiday anyway where people were in town from all around the world. So it would be like us saying on Thanksgiving Day or on Memorial Day. Well, on Pentecost Day, something special happened. And here's what it is, verse 2. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't these who are speaking Galileans? Now, Galileans like the wrong side of the track in Israel. These are the uneducated people, the people with the really thick accents. It'd be like us saying, aren't these people from Alabama? How is it that they're speaking French? <laughs> so then how is it that each of us hears them in our native languages? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to, uh, to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, and amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. <laughs> now, it's funny, when Peter comes up to give his sermon, this is the first thing that he addresses in the sermon. He's like, guys, don't suppose we've had too much wine. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning, right? Like, the 9 o'clock service does not drink. 
That's the 1045 service. So come back then for the drunken mat. Okay, I apologize already to 1045 service. So sorry, so sorry. Now there are three amazing, literally amazing symbols of the Holy Spirit that's coming. I hope you did not miss them in the text. Symbol number one of the Holy Spirit coming on that very first day is a mighty rushing wind. Now, the Holy Spirit is known as the breath of God. In the Hebrew, it's ruach. In the uh, Greek, in the New Testament, it's pneuma. But both of them essentially mean breath. And as you read through the Bible, one of the things you find is that the Holy Spirit oftentimes comes in this still, small voice, in a very gentle way. When we're quiet and listening, he comes as a breath in order to be able to tell us the ways of God. But not on this day. On this day, the Spirit came like a mighty rushing wind, like a tornado, like straight winds that we experience right in the midst of Nebraska. The Holy Spirit came in a mighty rushing wind so that nobody in the city would miss it. In fact, it says that everybody came out from their houses to see what was going on when they heard this sound. That happens in my neighborhood too. Does that happen in your neighborhood? Like if there's a tornado or straight winds that come, the first thing that happens after the straight winds die down is all the neighbors come out into the street, right? You inspect the damage, you look at the roofs, you talk about how amazing that thing was. Well, in Jerusalem, it was no different. Everybody heard that sound, they felt the wind, and they came out to see what was going on. They came out to the streets. And the wind of the Spirit reminds us of God's deep and abiding presence in our lives. That like the breath of God, he wants to be as close to us as air is to our lungs. He wants to be with us as frequently as we breathe. He wants to be the oxygen that fills our lifeblood. He is the breath of God that comes to live inside of us. He's the rubber meets the road member of the Trinity. He says, if you want to experience God, you experience him by the Holy Spirit living inside of you. It's the mighty rushing wind. Then we have part two. We have the Holy Spirit comes in fire, in fire. So in this case, he comes, the fire comes down from God, and it says, rests on each and every one of them. So all of them are there, the men and the women, they got the fire that's on top of them as they're experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. And what's happening here is not just a cool moment, like, hey, dude, you got fire on your head, you know, or yeah, you should talk furnace face. Uh, What's happening is a cataclysmic biblical shift that I do not want you to miss. Think about it. If you remember from the Old Testament story, fire came on the scene a number of times. The first time we see it is with Moses and the burning bush that's right in front of him. And there's a bush that was on fire but was not consumed. It represented the presence of God as God told Moses his name for the very first time. Then the people of Israel are wandering through the desert and God shows up in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, symbolizing God's guidance of the people and his presence with the people. Then you see in about 900 BC, they build the temple and Solomon prays and he offers a sacrifice on the first day and fire from heaven comes down and consumes that sacrifice, showing God says, I am pleased and my presence is now here in the temple. And then you have Elijah on Mount Carmel with the battle against the prophets of Baal. 400 prophets of Baal against one prophet of God. Whoever calls from from heaven and gets fire that falls on their sacrifice wins. And Elijah got fire to fall from heaven because his God was the real God. It reminds you of the power and reality of the God of the universe. Four episodes. But what's different about this episode on Pentecost morning is that there wasn't one big blast of fire. There were a bunch of little pieces of fire. It didn't come for the whole community at once. It came for individuals within the community. Now, as you read the Bible, you'll find that the Holy Spirit is real in the Old Testament, but he comes occasionally. And he only comes on certain people, not everybody, not ordinary people, just anointed people. And so when you get to the New Testament, you find that the Holy Spirit is not just there temporarily, and he's not just there for special people, he's there for everybody who will trust in Jesus. This is a massive paradigm shift. And do you know why it's possible in the book of Acts, and it was not possible before then? It's because of Jesus. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, 
Everybody who trusts in him has their past forgiven. So now we're clean on the inside and you have resurrection power that comes through Jesus' resurrection. When you have a clean place and resurrection power, you're ready to receive the Holy Spirit. Trust in Jesus, receive the Holy Spirit. So for the first time in history, they were able to receive the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives as fire. Oh, this is so cool, isn't it? All right, one more, one more. So uh, third thing that we find from the Holy Spirit in this passage is he sends them on mission. So right away, they're speaking languages that they don't know so that they can preach the best news ever to people in a language that they can understand. Now, as you read through the book of Acts, and I hope that you guys either get on the CCC app or you pull out this card in front of you and you take it home with you and begin reading along, because as you read along through this, you're going to notice something. Whenever you see the Holy Spirit do a miracle, it's not just for show. It's not like, hey, look how cool this is. There's a reason behind it, and it's always to send people on mission. So either you'll find Holy Spirit miracle, and then they went out and proclaimed the gospel, or Holy Spirit miracle, and then a bunch of people trusted in Jesus. You see that pattern happen all the way through. The Holy Spirit is here to bring glory to the Son and bring glory to the Father and send us on mission in order to proclaim the best news ever. And so that happens. When you seek the Holy Spirit for his presence and power in your life, one of the things you'll find out about him is that he sends you on mission. And if you respond and say yes and go on mission and do what he says, you'll get more of the presence and power and experience of the Holy Spirit and he'll send you on mission again. And it just keeps going through that because that's why the Holy Spirit is there. People go on mission, come to faith in Jesus. Okay, one more thing. And this is just a Bible bonus. It's like a sermon bonus for those of you guys who love the Bible. Uh, you'll want to hear about this. Because what happened on the day of Pentecost has a very deep tie back to the curse. One of the things you find about Jesus and the early church is they're always doing things that reverse the curse in Genesis and bring the kingdom of God. And when the curse gets reversed and the kingdom comes, well, at that point, you see the power of God being poured out in amazing, irresistible ways, and people are attracted. So the curse that gets reversed is what happened at the Tower of Babel. So Pentecost stands in stark contrast to what happened at the Tower of Babel. You guys may remember at the Tower of Babel, it was people who were trying to reach up to God. That's why they were building this tower. But at Pentecost, it's the power of God coming down to the people. At the Tower of Babel, you, remind, you remember that languages were confused and people were disoriented as a result of that. But at Pentecost, languages were clarified and people came together as a result of that. Because of Babel, there was the birth of nations and disunity and fighting between peoples. But because of what happened on Pentecost Day, everybody could hear the best news ever, and everybody could be welcomed into the family of God with unity, despite their ethnic or language background. This is what God is doing in this world. He's creating a new community where men and women can be side by side, where people of all ethnicities can be welcomed in, where everybody experiences the love of God. And this happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So back to the text. Peter, who apparently is speaking the home language, sets up, he gets up, and he delivers this very cool sermon, which I would encourage you to read at home. Read the whole sermon. What you'll find out in there is he starts off with these prophecies. And he says, guys, you shouldn't be surprised that this happened. This was prophesied in the Old Testament. Joel, for example, prophesied that the Spirit of God would be poured out on all people. Not just select people, but on all people. Joel prophesied that men and women would be prophesying side by side in public. And what do you know? That is exactly what you're seeing here today. Joel prophesied that the good news would go to all the far corners of the world, and what do you know that's happening today? Because here's what you see happen, going to the far corners of the world. This is a map of all of those different language groups and where they came from, the green, the green, the green. They had all come to Jerusalem, and they all heard the gospel right here, and then they went back home. He says this is a result, or this was prophesied by Joel all along. Because of this, you can experience the power of the Holy Spirit. You too can get what God brought on all these people. You can experience that. And then he says, Peter, he says, okay, part two of the sermon is, this is really all about Jesus. 
And Jesus was prophesied too. His death on the cross to forgive sins was prophesied. His resurrection from the dead was prophesied. You killed him, but God raised him from the dead so that all of us might be able to have new life in his name if you trust in him. Now, because of Pentecost, because of Pentecost, you can experience the Holy Spirit. Because of Pentecost, God breaks through ethnic barriers. Because of Pentecost, men and women are released for ministry. And because of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit can supernaturally guide you. Now, the people that day saw this, and this is their response. Bounce down to the end, Acts chapter 2, verse 37 says this. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? And Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off and for all whom the Lord will call. Take a look at this. You can imagine why this moment would be so powerfully attractive to these people. They wake up on a Sunday morning. They hear a mighty rushing wind. They run out to the southern steps of the temple where all of this stuff took place. They see these people with these freaky flames on them speaking the best news they've ever heard in the language of their heart. And when they see that, they go, I don't know what that is, but I want to get me some of that. It was attractive. It was irresistible. I want to have a piece of that. What should we do? And so Peter says, here's what you do. Repent. Turn away from your small dreams. Turn away from your sins. Turn away from all the things that have distracted you from God. And instead, be baptized. Go public that you're a believer in Jesus. Trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And your past gets wiped out. And, and, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This too can be yours if you trust in Jesus and Jesus alone. And not only you, but your kids. And your kids' kids and their kids, and their kids, and even people in far off Omaha, Nebraska, 2,000 years later, can receive the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives just by trusting in Jesus. Now, friends, I want to encourage you to actively seek the Holy Spirit. Here's some basic things that you can do to actively seek the Holy Spirit. Number one is to ask. I know it sounds overly simplistic, But ask God for the Holy Spirit to be at work in new ways in your life. The Bible says that if you ask for more of the Holy Spirit, God gives it to you. He's a good father who's not going to give you a stone if you ask him for a bread. If you ask him for the Holy Spirit, he's going to give you the Holy Spirit. And that may sound overly simplistic, but let me just ask the question. When's the last time you asked? Said, God, I want more of experience of the Holy Spirit. Now, theologically, let me warn you, you do not get more Holy Spirit when you ask for it. You got them all when you first decided to trust Jesus. But what you get is more experiences of the Holy Spirit, more submission to the Holy Spirit, more promptings by the Holy Spirit. And when you obey them, there's more to come after that as well. Second thing you want to do is you want to listen. You want to make space to hear what the Holy Spirit has to say for you. And different people hear the Holy Spirit differently. This is kind of a custom-made thing that God does differently for different people in different ways. For me, sometimes it happens in my official and formal prayer times when I'm with God. I will hear promptings of the Holy Spirit. But a lot of times, probably most of the time, God blitzes me when I'm not expecting it. As I'm kind of breathing in the life of the Spirit. My bike rides are a really common time when I'll get promptings from the Holy Spirit. Or most often for me, it's between 4 and 6 in the morning (laughs) when God wakes me up. And I assume he wakes me up because that's when he knows he can have my full and undivided attention. And he gives me his wisdom and prompts me to do things. And then when you listen to God, the third thing you do is take a risk. If the Spirit prompts you to forgive somebody, forgive them. If he prompts you to make a relationship with somebody who's difficult, make a relationship. If he prompts you to reach out to somebody who's far from God or who's exploring, reach out to that person. He'll prompt you to do all kinds of crazy things that fit who you are and your circumstance. He's the customizable member of the Trinity who takes the power of God and prompts you to change your life around that. So listen, take risks, and then finally hold on loosely. Hold on loosely. 
Because you never know, you never know what kind of interruption in your life is actually the power of God that you've been waiting for. When you hold your agenda too tightly, it's one of the key things that prevents the Holy Spirit from working. But if you can hold your agenda loosely and watch for where the Spirit is already at work in the lives of people around you, you begin to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. And here's the deal. When you listen and take risks and obey and hold on loosely, the Spirit knows that you're receptive and he says, okay, I'll give you the next step. I'll give you the next step. I'll give you the next step. And pretty soon, walking in the Spirit is as easy as it is to breathe. Friends, I would love to tell you all kinds of practical stuff about this. We don't have time this morning. But I will tell you that we did a series on this two years ago. There's an eight-part series that's on our app, on our website. If you want to learn to walk in the Spirit, download some of those messages. There's lots of great stuff in those if you want to learn more about being empowered by the Holy Spirit. But for now, let's go to the conclusion of the verses. The conclusion says this. With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. 3,000 people. This was the explosion of the early church. It happened on Pentecost Sunday, and it's when the church went from a handful of believers, maybe 100, all the way up to 3,000 people in a single day. They were baptized, they received forgiveness, and they got the Holy Spirit in their lives. They saw what was happening in front of them, and they said, I want some of that. And guys, it's my dream, my prayer for all of us, that people will see us in the schools and the marketplace, that we will so walk by the power of the Holy Spirit, that our lives will be so marked by the presence of God, that people will see us and they'll say, I want to get me some of that. And we'll get to tell them about Jesus who brings forgiveness and the Holy Spirit who will empower them for their lives. And our city will be different as each of us reach one more person. So do you want to experience power in your life? Lean into the Holy Spirit. You want guidance for your future? Lean into the Holy Spirit. Because God's plans for you are much bigger, trans-dimensionally bigger, when you lean into the Holy Spirit and we live as though we were empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen? Yeah. Let's stand together and pray. Father, we are grateful for your grace and your power. We're grateful for this amazing story from the book of Acts. And God, we just want to pray that prayer. Do it again, God. Do it again. Do it in Omaha, Nebraska. Do it at Christ Community Church. May your spirit be poured out in supernatural, empowering ways that we might know and love and follow you in ways that could not be explained in our regular four-dimensional reality. But your presence and power would be thick and empowering and guiding so that we might honor you in everything we do. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and God's people said, amen. amen.